everybody. <laughs> is this on? I don't think it is. I don't think it's on yet. It's not muted. It's it's Woody needs to turn you on at the top. It's no. not. It's not muted. Five. There we go. Hooray. We're ready to go. Party time. Okay. My talk is on uh, dramatic uh, adaptations of Tolkien. I was initially going to do as many as I could, then I realised there are far too many, so <laughs> the focus is more on the radio adaptations. But I still kept that title because I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Tolkien's work, especially The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, have been dramatised a number of times, on screen, on stage, on radio in countless languages and in numerous forms. It seems that making Tolkien's worlds come to life is a common desire amongst fans. Indeed, go to any Tolkien Society gathering and you'll undoubtedly hear songs sung, poems read, scenes acted and characters played, or even an entire play based on a minor work. I came from the generation that grew up with the Lord of the Rings films, of course. As such, they did have an impact on how I viewed not only the stories and characters, but the stories and characters as concepts. Uh, I read the books, of course, and loved them, but I later discovered the BBC radio adaptations and wore the tapes out, listening to them over and over again until I could recite the script back to front, which really annoyed my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I am a dyslexic person, and as such... Uh, what? Sorry, I thought you were... Sorry, hearing the voice of Satan if you recite it back. <laughs> well, that is the I am a dyslexic person, and as such, reading and writing do not come easily to me. Uh, growing up, I had less than helpful teachers who decided that literature wasn't a good path for me and I should find another pursuit. Uh, if not for the Lord of the Rings, I might well have done that. The audiobooks and dramas brought the worlds to life in ways that I... in new ways. And so I went to... Uh, so I want to focus on and examine something about them that I think is quite interesting. We've seen plenty of adaptations over the years, as well as the well-known cinematic Peter Jackson versions and radio dramas, to lesser-known plays and fan um, adaptations, uh, all of which must, one, must tackle one key issue, one that I think was tremendously important to Tolkien himself. More so than capturing the story or even the scenery in Middle-earth, one must capture the voice. Indeed, the power of the voice is a theme Tolkien comes back to time and time again. The voice of Saruman, of Aeonwe, of Gandalf, or indeed the very mouth of Sauron. The sound of voices was very special to Tolkien. The voice of Ilavata and the Einar through song creates the world. The voice of Luthien dethrones Morgoth himself. And it is at the very moment that, that when the dwarves first speak with language that Ilavata came to Aula to tell him to stop, according to History of Middle Earth 11. The Hobbit, especially, was a story Tolkien told out loud to his children, often with a running commentary from Christopher. This perhaps goes some way to explaining why it lends itself to a more oral style in the language. It was made to be heard, it was written to be read out. In the terms of phrase and the narrative aside, Ring of a storyteller speaking directly to the reader rather than a recorded history laying out the events of the past. Given this, one might imagine Tolkien would welcome adaptations of his work. There was a record of a children's play of The Hobbit, which he attended. However, Tolkien was very critical of an early dramatisation produced by the BBC in 1955 of The Lord of the Rings, going as far to say that he thought the book was very unsuitable for dramatic representation. Later, in 1958, an American film company set, sent to Tolkien a proposed outline for an animated cartoon adaptation. One of the first criticisms Tolkien had was in the spoken words. The dialogue was not right, and he was not happy with this. But, as he says, uh, but this document as it stands is sufficient to give me grave anxiety about the actual dialogue that, I suppose, will be used. I should say Zimmerman, the constructor of this uh, sketch list, is quite incapable of exerting or, adaptating, uh, ad or adapting spoken words of the book. He is hasty, insensitive, and impatient. You know what I mean. You can read it. Uh, later, in another letter criticising the same thing, he says, I do earnestly hope that in the assignment of actual speeches to the characters, they will be represented as I have presented them, in style and sentiment. I should resent perversion of the characters, and do resent it so far as it appears in this sketch, even more than the spoiling of plot and scenery. It would seem that anyone attempting to adapt Tolkien's work need to bear this in mind. 
Keeping the voices of his, cap of his characters was perhaps more important to Tolkien than anything else. Whether on screen or on radio, finding the voice for the roles must surely be of the utmost importance. I'm going to name drop here, but I spoke to Brian Sibley, who uh, <laughs> was the producer of the BBC Radio 4 adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. And he touched on this topic, saying when he was finding the voice of the characters, Interestingly, a listener wrote to me during the series run to say that Robert Stevens didn't sound like Aragorn, to which my response would be, what does Aragorn sound like? Like presumably something you heard in your head when you were reading the book. The radio production for Lord of the Rings has only sound to convey the whole story to the listener. The voice of the story, along with the music and sound effects, was paramount, as were the voices of the characters to which the producers had to pay special attention. Where an actor with tremendous physical presence may be able to project much through movement, facial expression, or lack thereof, a voice actor has no such luxuries. Brian Sibley and the team were fortunate to have some big-name actors on hand. Radio drama was something of a staple of BBC Radio 4, and so it should come as no surprise that some relatively well-known personalities were found for the various roles. As he says, a big name inevitably means that people who are familiar with an actor from stage, film, or TV will have a propensity to see the actor in their mind's eye. In the case of The Lord of the Rings, the performances of Michael Horden and John LeMessure, both well-known faces, would have played a part in how the listener saw the characters of Gandalf and Bilbo, who, whereas Bill Nye, at the time practically unknown, probably gave listeners a Sam who was easier and friendly to imagine, unencumbered by anything other than Bill's voice and performance. Incidentally, I, I only found out later on that it was Bill Nye doing yeah. Sam. It's a great performance. With a famous actor comes a lot of assumed imagery in the mind of the listener. However, this can be a distraction. I've known people who have said that they can't help but imagine John the Measure as Bilbo holding a martini whenever he speaks. <laughs> <laughs> how the voices perform can lend so much to the interpretation of the character, perhaps even more so than how they appear. If we consider the visual adaptations, let us look, for example, at the character of Gandalf, who appears in both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings radio adaptations, and is performed very differently in both. In 1968, BBC Radio 4 produced an eight-part dramatisation of The Hobbit. It was produced by Michael, Michael Kilgraf, and people who came to my talk last year will know I'm slightly obsessed with Doctor Who, and uh, he actually was uh, the original cyber controller in Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> the play sticks relatively closely to the book, and is, its serialised nature and its attempt to reflect the flow of the narrative, splitting it into episodes, perhaps came a little more naturally, as Tolkien's style did tend to be somewhat episodic, episodic especially in The Hobbit. This, no doubt, comes as a result of the story's origins in nighttime, bedly story, bedtime, nightly stories for Tolkien's children. Uh, Heron Carvick played Gandalf. Uh, he also just happened to have a bit part in Doctor Who, in The Keys of Marinus. Uh, his performance uh, does not have the gruff old man quality we would later come to associate with Gandalf from the performances of Ian McKellen and uh, Michael Horden. This is something more, there is something more mystical about him. His voice is higher, even slightly musical at times. Whenever he enchants his staff into light, it sounds, at least to me, uh, as if he's singing his spells, which may be appropriate given Middle Earth's history of songs being tied to magic. It may jar with some listeners if imagined versions of Gandalf. It gives him a sense of aloofness, of being distant and detached, and he is so, as he so often seems in The Hobbit, he doesn't seem quite to be part of their world, and his voice is just a tad too odd. Given what we know of Gandalf's origins, mostly unknown to the producers of the radio drama, this might be something of happy coincidence. And I have an example in a clip here. Good morning. Good morning. Do you wish me a good morning, or mean that it is a good morning, whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Hmm? Or that it is a morning to be good on? Well, <laughs> well um, all of them at once, sir. Um, if you have a pipe about you, sit down, have a fill of my tobacco. Mm -hmm. We've got all the day before us. You may have all day, but I do not. I'm mm. looking for someone to share in an adventure I'm arranging. It's very difficult to find. <laughs> <laughs> There's considerable humour to be found in this slightly patronising Gandalf who is effortlessly superior to his companions and knows it. His distance and preoccupations with matters elsewhere also add to the sense of unease that makes you wonder just what his motivation is. He's not a Gandalf who is easily trusted or even relied upon. In the BBC radio adaptations of The Lord of the Rings, however, Michael Horden gives a perhaps more familiar version of Gandalf. He is to some extent a little close, close to Tolkien's descriptions and insistence that the wizard appeared to the world little more than a travelling vagabond at times. His voice is powerful, yes, 
but in a different way to, to uh, Carvix. There's a force behind his voice when roused, and a shuddering and tremendous power waiting to erupt. And I have a little bit of that here. Everything. The ring as well. Well, uh, yes, yes, I, I suppose so. Where is it? In an envelope, you must know. There, on the mantelpiece. Where? Bilbo? I don't see it. What? Oh, bless myself. No, no, no. no it's, it's here. It's here in my pocket. Now, isn't that odd? But then, after all, why not? Why shouldn't it stay there? No, 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 no. There's no need to get angry or fashion. I'm angry because it's mine. It's my own. My precious. Uh, yes. My precious. Uh, it's been called that before, but not by you. Well, I must say it now. Even if that horrid golem creature said the same once, it's not his now. He lost it, and I found it, and now it belongs to me, and I shall keep it. If you say that again, Bilbo, I shall get angry. And then you shall see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. <laughs> 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 At the same time, Horden's Gandalf is perfectly comfortable drinking tea, having breakfast while discussing the return of Sauron and the impending doom of the world. <laughs> uh, whereas uh, Carvick's Gandalf seemed much too unusual to sit comfortably at any moment, let alone when the fate of the world was at hand, Horden's Gandalf grows as a character, moreover, perhaps because he has a lot more time to develop and explore deeper aspects of the character. He has to run the gamut of close friend, powerful wizard, and political negotiator. As such, a distant and mystical voice might not have been quite so versatile. Brian Sibley said of Horton's time in the production, however, As for Gandalf, Michael Horton, if truth be told, never entirely understood what was going on. <laughs> he was, for example, genuinely perplexed by the wizard's seeming demise in Moria in episode 8, and asked Jane Morgan whether his agent had been wrong about the number of episodes which he was required. When told that he'd be resurrected in episode 12, he simply went to splendid, splendid, and shambled away. <laughs> Nevertheless, by intuition or some other theatrical magic, he became Gandalf, by turn wise and stern and compassionate, a force for good, a constant light in an ever-darkening storm. The voice of Gandalf may indeed be one of the most important aspects to get right in these stories, but more important still is the voice of the story itself. Both radio adaptations employ a narrator, uh, but there are key differences between them. The Hobbit's narrator is almost a character in his own right. <laughs> Anthony Jackson, who takes the role of tale-bearer in this adaptation, is more than just someone telling the story. Indeed, the narrator is given more life than some of the other characters in The Hobbit. There are 13 dwarves, after all. In the beginning of the first episode, the In a Hole in the Ground monologue is turned into a conversation between Bilbo and the narrator, which is one of my favourite parts of the radio adaptation, and I have a clip of it here. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Yeah, and I'm not a nasty, dirty witch, though, nor yet a dry, sandy bear. My hole was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door, painted green. Huh? Which opened onto a tunnel shaped wall with panelled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, and lots of pegs for hats yes. and coats. Well, I'm very fond of visitors, do you see? And he was quite well to do. Uh, yeah. 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 By the way, uh, my name is, is Baggins, um, B A W G. I am as Bilbo Baggins, um, at your service and your family's. Yes, I suppose uh, hobbits need some description uh, nowadays since they have become so rare. Hobbits are, or were, smaller than dwarves. Oh, yes, I think if we may be smaller than dwarves, at least we don't have those, those silly dwarves. Yes, they're inclined to be fat in the stomach. Well built, oh, yeah. hmm? Very well built. They're inclined to be well built. <laughs> and dressed in bright colours, chiefly green and yellow. They wear no shoes because their feet grow natural leathery so. It's very entertaining. Uh, Jared Murphy narrated the Lord of the Rings adaptations and gives a much more straightforward performance. The narrator doesn't just fulfil the role as a tool of the narrative, but as a presentation too. The narrator, in delving into Tolkien's world, such as when Saddlefax is given his introduction, gives us a small glimpse into Tolkien's love of languages outside of dialogue. What character there is to the narrator is down to the written words of the book. Uh, there are times when the acceptance of Tolkien's prose is just given straight to the narrator 100%. There's a softness to Murphy's narration, but also a directness. He is sterner than Robin Mrs. audiobooks that would come later, but he still maintains an air of wonder at times, 
I'm going to play a clip of uh, the intro to the Lord of the Rings. Long years ago, in the second age of Middle Earth, the elven smiths of Eregion forged rings of great power. Then the Dark Lord Sauron forged one ring in the fires of Mount Doom in the land of Mordor. This ring he made to rule the others, and their power was bound up with it, so that they could last only so long as it too should last. And from that time, war never ceased between Sauron and the elves. Three rings they hid from him, but the others he gathered into his hands, hoping to make himself master of all things. Then was an alliance made against the Dark Lord, and Sauron was, for that time, vanquished. But at length his dark shadow stretched forth once more, and he sought again for mastery over the rings of power. I also wanted to play some other clips, but I, for some reason they weren't downloading um, properly. There's one section where he um, describes shadow facts that's quite nice, and uh, which is why I mentioned it here. And there's a couple of other places where he, he does go into some of Tolkien's description. And I think the sort of calm and uh, distant voice kind of works in those cases. I don't think having that argument between Frodo and the narrator would quite work in The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> As an aside, I'm going to mention the 1966 animated adaptation of The Hobbit, directed by Gene Deitch of the Czech Republic. It, too, incorporates a narrator with a slightly jovial voice, though this performance was more of a one-man show as Herbert Last as all of the voices. Originally intended to be a full-length feature film, but never mounted to more than 12 minutes. It's certainly a curious adaptation. Uh, it takes a lot more liberties than perhaps even Peter Jackson in his worst moments. There's a certain charm to it, if nothing else. Many of the original elements are still there. The City of Dale, the dragon, now named Slag. <coughs> Thor and Oakenshield, who is no longer a dwarf. Uh, Gandalf the Wizard, Bat, Bilbo, etc., etc. Uh, they also, the, the Arkenstone is there, but for some reason it's turned into a giant bow and arrow and used to shoot the dragon. That's <laughs> weird. Peter Jackson, please, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's where the similarities end. Uh, the uh, artist who did that was from Czechoslovakia, who was quite well known for doing um, children's books. And apparently, this is one of his very, very lesser known books. And when I told this to members of the Czech Talking Society, they were very amused by this. Um, <coughs> capturing Ch Tolkien's voices, uh, capturing the voices of Tolkien's work is something of a challenge, not least because it can be such a matter of interpretation. If I were to delve into all the various interpretations, as well, visual interpretations as well, we might be here for another few hours. One could talk at length about John Hurt's Aragorn, his impressive voice being somewhat at odds with his perhaps a little too short tunic. <laughs> and the Raskin Basque adaptations and being perhaps a little too musical. Looking to the future, will we see more adaptations to come? Uh, we've already had the beauty radio dramatisations of the Tales from the Perilous Realm in which we hear distinct voices even for old Tom Bombadil. If you've been waiting for a dramatisation of Tom Bombadil, the Tales from the Perilous Realm, have it. Um, it's all right. Um, <laughs> of course, all this raises the obvious question, will there ever be a Silmarillion adaptation? I asked Brian to do this, and he said that I proposed a dramatisation of the Silmarillion to the BBC Radio 4 in, I think, 2014 and was turned down. I believe it could make a very powerful programme of dramas if some of the elements slash stories could be presented at varying lengths and in different styles, but I doubt it will ever happen. But then again, <laughs> then again indeed. Uh, we may not have to rely on the BBC or large Hollywood studios. There are, of course, fan-made ad uh, adaptations like Born of Hope and Hunt for Gold, showing at least in principle that people will seek out Tolkien dramatisations and hope there may still be more coming. If any part of Tolkien's work comes to be dramatised again, the voice is perhaps the most important, one of the most important parts. It was certain, certainly important to Tolkien himself, and as such, can't be ignored. Uh, for example, if you give Feanor a squeaky voice, you will have much less of a presence than if you give him a loud, booming voice, I imagine. <laughs> so tonight, as we have a adaptation of Leaf by Niggle, <coughs> ask yourself, what does Niggle sound like? Why? What does a leaf sound like? Why? <laughs> Make sure you ask your voice. Thank you. Anybody want to raise any issues?
Yes. I have to say, the title board, the other one is about this. You will be too young to remember this, Joel. Because those of us who are certain age will remember that Michael Gordon was the voice of Paddington. Yes. <laughs> and when I first heard Michael Gordon in the Lord of the Rings, I couldn't get the image. <laughs> Because the fact he'd been using voiceovers before, and there's something like Paddington Bear, it was a very big thing. <laughs> and it did linger in the mind. <laughs> it was James as well. Yeah, the aud I really like the audiobooks. Um, I I grew up listening to the audiobooks, as I said, and the Silmarillion audiobooks especially, I really liked, although I later found out that um, the narrator, whose name escapes me right now, uh, he pronounced Ma Robin, no, it was Martin Shaw, yes. He pronounces some of the names wrong, and so I spent a long time uh, mispronouncing Mythros as Mathros, which really annoyed some of my friends. And uh, I, I, it was only when I heard like Christopher Tolkien saying some of the names that I realised that um, the mountain in Valinor that I'd always thought was uh, Taniquetil was apparently Taniquetil, which to me sounds like some kind of headache medication. <laughs> I think the classic name for me is, is when you hear Tolkien pronounce Sauron in yeah. some of the things. And, but he's not, he's Sauron and it's... Yes, but I always thought of him as Sauron. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And it's very, very difficult to actually. Yeah. Or slag, as they call Slag, as they say. Smog was what some people, a friend of mine who went looking at the film verse and thought he sounded smog. Alex? One of the things is the narrator that you played from The Lord of the Rings, which I think wouldn't want to have an argument with, there's something about the measured delivery, the kind of calm or poor sense of delivery, the choice of music. Mm. But very reminiscent to me of the World of War. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Olivier. Do you know what the sort of timing between the two? Ah, uh, oh god, I can't remember. I am. Um, yeah, it's within it. was early 70s. Yeah, I think this was well. The race was 81. 1981 was when it came out. So it's been about 10 years. I would like to say like radio drama was kind of a staple of Beauty Radio 4 at the time, so like I imagine you probably had some of the same people working on it. People tended to stay in jobs. It's almost like it feel more real. Yeah, and this happens, I mean like the music in the Lord of the Rings is brilliant, and Heidi oh, yeah. uh, did a talk on uh, the music in the adaptations a while back, which was very, very good. Uh, it's probably out there on the internet somewhere you can find it. Um, whereas the music in The Hobbit isn't quite as good. Um, no, I sorry, it's it's awful. Dwarves <laughs> <laughs> cannot play. This this is it's, an issue. It's it's awful. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can hear a bit of it at the, at the start of that quote. Good morning! Good morning! You wish me. You can hear that sort of sweet noise. Who's playing that? <laughs> Gentleman at the back. You mentioned a radio adaptation of the Sun Radio. Yeah. Do you think there may ever be a film adaptation of the Sun Radio? Or is that horrible? I don't know. I. I <clears throat> Well, I think it depends on a lot of things. I mean, uh, I don't think the estates are particularly in favour of it at the moment, uh, but you never know. I doubt we'll ever see a single adaptation of the entire summer, and I think it would be ill-advised to try and adapt the entire summer into one of them. The Honourable Gentleman at the front has a, a, a supplementary question. I think you could do like to, a film about Turin, you could do a film about Baron you could do a film about Feyenoord. I think you could do programmes, as Brian Sidley said, of different adventures from the summer. My, yeah, my answer was following on from Joel's really. I think, I think filming the Silver is is as nonsensical as filming the Bible. Sorry, we've got a question. Supplementary. Supplementary, just to say, there is a group of people called the Mythgard Institute, and they are actually, there's a podcast I've been doing for the last year and a half, 
which is the casting what the Silmarillion film would be. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's interested in listening to that, it's on the, on the Myth Guardians. We had decades of fun casting the Lord of the Rings oh, film, and then somebody came along and spoiled it all. Now here's the best thing, when we talk about casting the films, I remember circa 2005 uh, saying, you know, when we were casting people who weren't in the films, I'd said of Radagast, you know who I think would be great? Sylvester McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, quiet. You start again, Andrew. Nigel Susskind recorded a tape called Microphones and Digital. Yes, that's right. Um, and when he starts talking to him with Michael, uh, uh, it's, it's by a sibling, Michael Bacon, who actually made, made the program. And they said, they sold him and they said, we couldn't have the drops in the characters. So the obvious one we're going to draw is Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a moment of silence in that all there. Uh, well, they go on to Tom Bobadil. Maggie? You don't actually mention, does anyone remember that Jack and Laura did Yes. 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 It, was, it was on my original list of things. Ten years old. Yes, it was. Anybody else? Joel has brought some copies of his wonderful yes, fantasy book. my new book, The Sky Slayer, it comes out today. So if anyone would like a copy, I have He'd, he'd be I'll delighted to sell you a copy. and yes. Just try and stop him signing it quite <laughs> I'll sign your face if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Dave.